My name is John Bowers. I was born and raised in Mesa, Arizona, and I um, consider myself to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I, I, I want to make it clear that he's my end goal and that how I live my life is in an attempt to be more consecrated to him and to live for him. I was, I was born in Mesa, Arizona to a wonderful family. Um, I'm the youngest of seven children. My dad is an artist by profession and we lived out in the desert away from a lot of people, so we, we made our own fun for a lot of my childhood. Uh, a lot of that involved making movies with each other, um, most of which were not the most politically correct and involved a lot of cross-dressing, which was very entertaining for everyone. Um, but I, I recognized from a young age that I was a little different. Uh, I, I knew that I was very sensitive compared to other boys and that I was very curious about, uh, about men. I noticed at a young age that I was kind of distanced from a lot of boys and what they were pursuing. I, as I entered school, I noticed that I was playing a lot more with the girls. Um, I liked playing with the Barbies more than the cars and I liked playing four square with the girls more than soccer or basketball with the boys. So just some inconsistencies that I found with my gender um, or at least the norms based around that. But I, I also had a very low self-esteem from a very young age. And combine that with my curiosities around men, at the age of seven, I found myself being sexually abused by someone in the community. Um, he was a minor and I, I didn't really know what was going on, but I, I felt a connection, um, and I, I really appreciated the, the sense of belonging, I guess, or just that friendship and how close we were, or at least how I perceived it to be. There came a time when my, my mother found out about a loved one getting pregnant out of wedlock, and I was the one that was there with her when she found out. And I remember her holding me and sobbing and just completely shattered. And I didn't really completely understand what was going on. But when she explained to me, that's when I got the talk and learned about pregnancy and sexuality, then I recognized that that was something that I was already participating in. And I started worrying that I was gonna get pregnant or that I was gonna get some kind of STD. And I was worried that I was going to crush my family if they ever found out. And that because this was such a serious sin that if anyone found out, then I would be ostracized or worse. And so that's something that I kept secret for a long time. Eventually I, got out of that situation and it, and it ended, but I still had a lot of guilt and shame, an incredible amount of shame. And I often found myself weeping in my room and I couldn't talk to anyone about why I was so upset, but I felt like I was doomed to burn in hell and I was eight and I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. And from that point, there was a lot of changes in my life. I started to gain a lot of weight, um, much to my chagrin, and got made fun of a lot throughout school for that. And I became a lot more quiet and developed depression and anxiety around that, um, which is understandable. I, I tried to get support from church leaders, but, and I, I did my best, but I, I certainly didn't give enough information for them to understand really what was going on, just that I had committed sexual sins um, and that, and I was told to, to pray and to just try not to think those thoughts anymore um, as far as those, those desires. Um, I got support where I could. Uh, I, my teachers talked to my parents about me needing psychological um, counseling and 
I, I did my best to, to hide a lot of the pain that I was experiencing, but it was very obvious to a lot of people. And I was very, very sensitive and just the fact that I was shy and overweight and super sensitive set me up for a lot of bullying throughout my childhood, which intensified problems and made me feel even more distance from other men my age. And then I started even more developing these attractions to men. And they, as I entered puberty, they became increasingly more sexualized as everyone's do in, during that time period. I heard a lot from my priesthood leaders, like in, in young men's, that the attractions that we would develop throughout teenage years and throughout our lives were to help us to, to live the plan of salvation and that there were blessings from Heavenly Father that to have these attractions toward women would help us to live a happy life and that we would build the kingdom of God through our marriages. And so that hurt a lot as a youth to hear those, hear it worded that way because I felt like apparently God didn't love me enough to give me that gift. And I, I don't, I don't know if I ever expected Heavenly Father to, to take these attractions away from me. Um, but I certainly hoped that he would forgive me for the things that I had done as a seven year old. At around the time that I received the Aaronic Priesthood, I put a lot of effort into um, in trying to heal my relationship with my Heavenly Father as I was perceived that it had been damaged. And although I felt like no one could love me for what I had done and the feelings that I was increasingly feeling that I would, I would never be for worthy of love, but at least perhaps I could be forgiven. And so I became very devout as a teenager in my faith. And I wouldn't say that I ever had a huge awakening as far as my testimony being um, manifest, but I, I believe that I've always had a strong testimony of Jesus Christ. And I've never really had a doubt that was substantial about his divinity and that there was a plan of salvation, although I, I wasn't sure where I fit into that plan. And I, I, I did the best that I could to be the best Mormon boy I could. And I've heard that story a million times from other people who experience same-sex attraction. So it makes me feel a little bit more normal. But I, I got my duty to God at a young age. I did my Eagle Project down in Mexico among the Tarahumara Native Americans. I, um, I read the Book of Mormon at a young age and really, and, and tried to bear my testimony and do everything that I could to gain access to the atonement of Christ. My favorite scripture is in Alma chapter seven, verses 11 through 13, where we learn about how Christ knows what it's like to be tempted and he knows our every sorrow and pain and sickness. And so that has given me a lot of comfort throughout my life to know that our my savior and my redeemer knows exactly what it's like to be me and to experience temptation and to be ostracized or feel distant from the people I care about as well as everyone else. Around the time that I was being sexually abused as a child, I started developing uh, migraines. And throughout my life, they've became increasingly worse to the point where I'm always in pain and I always have a headache. And sometimes they develop into really bad headaches and migraines that have required hospitalization. And I've gone to dozens of different doctors and specialists and tried dozens of medications and treatments and spent thousands of dollars trying to remedy that. And it's never been treatable and no one can really tell me what's wrong. And so for, a, for many years, I felt like God was punishing me. And this was his, a manifestation of his disappointment in me um, for being attracted to men. 
and wanting these uh, uh, romantic and sexual relations with them. And that also really affected my social, my self-esteem and my ability to socialize because I felt like I was a broken person. And that every, every trial that I was facing was basically a punishment from God for being this, this dirty, unworthy person. Um, and I didn't really understand um, sexuality very well um, because I had a, like a one-time experience with being told how sex even worked. I had a lot of questions about homosexuality because I didn't have a label to put on it for a long time because in my house we didn't really talk about it. Um, we didn't talk about sexuality, period. Um, and I had to learn through the internet because my parents would take me out of school during sex ed. And so I learned a lot about what homosexuality was. And fortunately, I never got into pornography. Um, the only times that I saw any kind of pornography were women. And I was just kind of like, ew. So it wasn't really a problem for me. But I certainly know what it's like to be tempted to look at that. And I, I had to learn a lot about what I was going through by what I read on the internet. And that didn't, it didn't give me a lot of hope because it seemed like as I learned more about sexuality uh, through the internet and that I was someone who experienced same-sex attraction and therefore I must be a homosexual, that I had two choices which were to embrace that aspect of who I was and live life as an open homosexual, where I would be able to have the kind of connection and um, deep connection that I would have with, some, with another man, or I would have to live in, in isolation and be, be constantly asked why I wasn't married, which is still something that I experience, um, and, and just completely shut that out of my life and just try to either get married or just try to live the rest of my life as a celibate Mormon um, and never let anyone know. And that sounded great to me. I promised myself that I would never tell anyone that I was experiencing these things. So that I, that, these were all things that I was struggling with as I entered junior high um, and I, I recognized that I was not very athletic. Um, I, was, I was very overweight, and instead of going along with a lot of the men my age into sports, I started going into music and drama and art, and I really excelled at those things. I did extremely well in art, um, and I was winning competitions all the time, and I did a lot of acting in junior high, which has really helped me in a variety of ways to be able to channel a role, which I, which the role I usually channeled was a heterosexual, um, which was convenient. Um, and I, I did experience a lot of bullying even at that point because in my art classes, I was often drawing like fantasy creatures or mainly like fairies or maidens or things that were not necessarily the most Know, heteronormative subject matter and so I got teased a lot and people started asking me if I was gay and I, I did my best to to push that down and I as I entered high school I had been on the swim team because my mom forced me to be on the swim team for four years and while I looked like a beluga whale I certainly couldn't swim like one and wearing a Speedo got old, so I switched from being on the swim team to volleyball. And at first that was a really wonderful experience. It was very difficult, but I lost like 50 pounds over a semester and started to recognize that I could actually compete and that I was pretty good at volleyball. And I, I gained some confidence, but I still felt a big distance between myself and the other teammates. I had hoped that I would be able to have 
a strong relationship with them and that we'd have that I'd have a brotherhood that I had always wanted. And I've had guy friends throughout my life and close ones, but for the most part I've had a vast majority of female friends. So going into volleyball I had hoped that I would achieve that and at first it was it was a great and fulfilling experience. But after I got onto the varsity team as a junior and was starting um, a lot of the other seniors and players were pretty negative toward me. Um, they would, they recognized that I was shy and wouldn't stick up for myself. And I experienced a lot of sexual harassment from them. They would tear my clothes off in public and bully me in the locker room and things like that. And it was, it was a really difficult time for me. Every day I would come home from practice and I would have a migraine and I was doing poorly in school and I was extremely depressed and anxious. And like on top of that, I had bad acne, which once I get to, he to heaven, assuming I get there, I'm gonna have a long chat with Heavenly Father about acne because I don't think that's a very good idea. But anyway, I digress. I, I was extremely depressed and it came to the point where I decided that I was going to kill myself because I was so I was so distanced from who I wanted to be and I felt so dark and hopeless that I was never going to be attracted to girls and that these attractions would never go away and that I would be struggling with migraines and just chronic pain for the rest of my life. And I, I was so, so depressed and drowning in the depths of despair that I felt like there was no other option. And so I, I vividly remember the day that I was preparing to kill myself and um, I had the gun and I was ready to, to escape. But I had a very spiritual experience that day, um, an intervention through the Spirit, and I, I was able to recognize that Heavenly Father did love me and that He had a role for me to play and among other things that were revealed to me. And so I promised him that I wouldn't kill myself, that I would do my best to live the commandments and make the sacrifices that I needed to make in order to, to return to him someday. After that point, I felt like I needed to make some changes. So I quit the volleyball team, well, after the season ended, and I joined choir. And choir was a complete turning point in my life. I found that I was pretty good at it and I made connections with people and with with men and women and I felt such a strong bond with these these other students and I was able to recognize how strong the spirit was manifest to me through music and so I've gained a lot of comfort and strength through music throughout my life especially from that point and I I went off to college with music scholarships and I went to Eastern Arizona College in Thatcher, Arizona. And I, I recognized that I was worthy of being loved because of the incredible experiences I'd had with, with other students through choir. And um, I, I struggled with I wouldn't necessarily call it an eating disorder, but I wound up in the hospital because I lost a lot of weight and was was trying to deal with my migraines in unhealthy ways. And so I, after my first semester, um, I came home and started preparing to go on a mission. But I was very nervous because even the idea of going on a mission is scary enough for anyone. But the thought of living 24-7 with another man was, was very intimidating to me. And I didn't even know if gay people could go on missions because it's never been discussed or, and homosexuality in my youth was never seen as a good thing or painted in, in a positive light. Um, in our lessons, it was always skimmed over and a lot of people would make jokes about it and call it an abomination um, during Prop 8 in California, Arizona was also experiencing a proposition called Prop 102, which was the same principle. 
And so I was even bullied in high school for being a Mormon because they knew that I was opposing gay marriage. And there is a, a gay straight alliance club at my school that would bully me on camera because of my beliefs. And that definitely, it was, it was ironic and I wanted to laugh at them and explain how, you know, ironic it was that they were making fun of one of their own people for having a different mindset. But I, I decided to, to go to my bishop and explain what was going on in my life and the struggles that I was experiencing. Um, and so I, I prayed a lot to prepare myself. And, and one of the things that really motivated me to do that and to be more open was I found a copy of um, In Quiet Desperation, which is an excellent book. And I, it was in my mom's closet, interestingly enough. Um, and I, I read that shortly before coming out to my bishop. And I had an interesting um, experience with, with that and coming out to my bishop where the right after I told him that I was experiencing same-sex attraction and that I didn't know if I could go on a mission, he said, well, John, we just need to put you on testosterone supplements. And, you know, we, we, I, I didn't do that. I feel like I have plenty of body hair as it is and I don't need any more help in that regard. And so that, that took me by surprise especially since I had, it had taken so much courage and prayer and fasting to get to the point where I could talk about it. But then he said that I needed to go to LDS Family Therapy, um, I guess to make sure I wasn't too gay to function. That was, that was scary enough, but he also told me that I needed to tell my parents. And that was certainly the, the most terrifying experience of my life. I, I love my parents, and I, my patriarchal blessing explains that they're, they're valiant and that they taught me the gospel of pure, in its purity in my childhood and that they loved me dearly and that my heavenly parents loved me dearly. So I, I opened up to them and I, I'll never forget that experience either. I, after our, my siblings left, I had my parents come upstairs with me and I remember sitting on the on their bed and just crying and trying so desperately to get the words out and it was it was absolutely horrifying that I was I was to this point because I felt like I I would never be able to be seen by them in the same way that they wouldn't love me that they would always feel a, a sense of disappointment in me or or disgust or any number of negative emotions. But after I told them in my word, own words, I said, all of my life I've experienced same gender attraction. And I just, I had my eyes closed because I didn't have the, the courage to look them in the eyes and tell them that. And I was, I was very worried as my mother started to cry that I was a great disappointment to them. And I recognized that they would have to rethink their their expectations and their hopes for me because it likely wouldn't match exactly what they had always wanted for me. But my my dad spoke up and was very, I don't know if casual is the right word, but very to the point that, you know, we love you and the fact that you're struggling with something like this doesn't change that. And we all experience temptation and weakness and susceptibilities that we have to work on throughout our lives and to, to master as we prepare to, to live with Heavenly Father. And that was a huge a huge weight lifted off my shoulders as my parents embraced me and were extremely supportive and they still are to this day. And I feel so sorry for people who have not had that experience. Um, it was a miracle in my eyes. And they, they supported me as I went through 
um, LDS family therapy and a lot of counseling. From the very first appointment, my counselor made it clear that I was perfectly able to go on my mission as far as my attractions went, that I wouldn't pose any kind of threat to others or to myself. And well, like, duh. But I experienced major depression and anxiety. And that was something that we need, needed to address before I could go on my mission. And so I went through um, about eight months worth of counseling. And that was a very difficult time for me because people were always asking me, why aren't you on your mission yet? Like you're almost, you're almost 20 and you're, you're not even going to school. Like what's going on? And they, they had good intentions and I try not to let it get to me, but it was very frustrating. But eventually I got authorization to go and I was called to the Georgia Atlanta North mission. And that was a wonderful experience and also a very difficult and um, harrowing um, journey for me. I hoped that Heavenly Father would really help me with my same-sex attractions as I went out into the field because I was dedicating all of my time to Him and I had made, I had earned money throughout my life and paid for my mission for that. and. Uh, hopefully he would at least help me to cope with that on my mission. But I found that I was almost immediately attracted to other missionaries and that a lot of my expectations and worries were getting thrown around. And I, I decided that I needed to get some, some counseling of some kind. And so I went to my mission presence wife and asked her for counsel for if it was possible for me to get some psychological help. And that's when I met Jenny Cook, who was my counselor um, on my mission. And she, she really helped me to understand that I had been sexually abused, that I didn't make those choices because I was evil, but because I was susceptible as a child, and that my Heavenly Father loved me. I, I can't thank her enough for, for helping me to understand that. And I hope that with my children someday, I'll be able to explain how sexual abuse is, is complicated to overcome, but that it is possible. And I, I have a very strong testimony of the atonement because I have been able to forgive the person who perpetrated that abuse. And I've been able to feel such a profound sense of of love and from my savior and and forgiveness for the people that had hurt me throughout my life and i think it's very important that we give other people the grace that we so desperately de so desperately desire and and that has been something that throughout my mission i was able to help other people to understand and i was able to make incredible friendships and experience a brotherhood that I never had felt before. And, and so I, when other people ask me if they should go on missions even though they experience these attractions, I say absolutely because I was able to learn so much and grow so much and I was able to be a, a very effective missionary. Um, coming home from my mission was very difficult because I no longer had, first of all, that that spiritual environment, but I also was distance away from so many of those close friendships and didn't have kind of that force bonding that missions involve. And I, I know that the Lord had blessed me throughout my mission to not be attracted to my companions, and that was a miracle to me. But as I came home, the attractions were still just as strong and not that I had ever felt like they would be taken away by serving a mission, but I had certainly hoped that I would be able to be a stronger person and be able to handle those better. And I didn't necessarily feel that way when I returned. And it was a very dark time for me. When I, the, the week I got home, I looked up Ty Mansfield because he was the author of In Quiet Desperation. And I, I asked my mom, like, why, why did you have that book? And she's like, 
well, your father and I kind of thought. And I was like, dang it! I got you. You get so you you think you're so great at acting that you can just that this is a complete secret to everyone. But apparently, I'm a lot more flamboyant than I that I had, I foresee myself. Anyway, so I I looked up Ty Mansfield, and um, I found out that he had written or compiled Voices of Hope, the the book, um, and that there's the Voices of Hope videos, and those were an incredible um, strength to me during that time, and I had the feeling that one day I would be brave enough to share my story, but um, that was not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, I, I decided on my mission that I was going to start a blog to share my experiences because before my mission, the internet had not given me any kind of hope that there was a chance for me to, to live a, a life that was in accordance with the gospel and still be happy. And so when I came home, I started connecting with other people with, who experienced same-sex attraction and um, began writing my blog. And during that time um, and reaching out to other people who were Mormon or had been Mormon and who experienced same-sex attraction, um, I started getting exposed to people that were not necessarily wanting to live a life based around Christ. And there was not a lot of support in Arizona for people that wanted to stay in the church. And I found myself experiencing a lot of anger toward the church and blaming my insecurities on the offenses that people had given me at church, even though they certainly had no idea that someone in the ward might actually experience same-sex attraction. Um, and so I, I felt a lot of anger during that time and felt and fell into a very deep depression. And I, as I returned to school at Eastern Arizona, I went to my bishop and, and talked to him a lot about it and the struggles that I was having. At that time, he told me that I needed to really prioritize the temple and that I needed to make sure that that was a major part of my life. And as I, I decided that for that year, I was gonna to go to the temple every week and try and gain back that, that strong spirit that I had felt on my mission. And I had already, from a young age, experienced the spirit of Elijah and was very interested in family history and indexing and had done a lot of, a lot of that work. And so as I began this year of weekly temple attendance, I was also intensely working on family history. And, and this is really important to my journey because I have found that through bringing family names to the temple, I've been able to gain access to, to their love and their support. And I have felt them with me as I've been going through very difficult times. And in Second Nephi, we're taught that angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I certainly have a testimony of that, that I have been given advice and strength and support from those beyond the veil and that they're counting on me. And so I have grown to love the temple and I hope that others can, can recognize the strength that comes from the mountain of the Lord. And even when people aren't, aren't temple recommend holders, they can still gain strength from that, and even being on the temple grounds. And so throughout the coming years, I've, I've found hundreds of names and indexed thousands and have come a really long way in that. And it's, it's something that has definitely kept me motivated to stay true. Because when I walk through the doors of the temple, I'm reminded why I still try. That there is strength and there is comfort that is found within the walls of the temple. And that's something that I never want to lose. And, and so that's always, that's been a priority for me. And so essentially every week since I returned from home or since I started going to the temple, I've, I've gone 
and, and attended that temple. And I, I can't stress enough how important that is in consecrating yourself to the Lord. During my time at Eastern Arizona, I participated in every musical situation I could, every group I could get into, um, and those were the happiest years of my life. And I became, became more and more confident in myself and was able to open up to more and more of my friends that I experienced same-sex attraction, and I never had a negative experience or repercussion from that. And it has really helped me overcome my shame around uh, how different I am from everyone else um, in that regard, because I've always been received with love and acceptance and empathy. And for a long time, I was frustrated in thinking that no one could understand me and that no one could really know what it was like to be me. And over time, I, I recognized that the only person that knows who, how anyone feels truly is Jesus Christ and that he alone is the, the source of comfort and, and power that we need to overcome any challenges that we face. And then building off of that, I've come to know that your friends and family likely don't have a very strong concept of what you're going through, but they are extremely helpful and you've been put together for a reason. And I, I have felt so much love and acceptance and have grown to love myself by being more open. And a lot of people wonder why I would be so vulnerable in, in sharing this part of my life that I've been so secretive about for so long. But it's helped me recognize that I'm really not that different from other people, especially from other men. There's, there's a masculinity that I had previously felt distance from, but similar to learning another language, um, you can learn the language of other people and their experiences, and you can speak to that. And that's really helped me in my journey to know that while I may have no idea what, like, a, what, just name a generic football term, I probably won't know what it means, but I can learn. I can learn how to work on cars, and that's something that I've also been working on. Um, and so I don't have to live in a cage and say, because I experienced same-sex attraction, I can't explore other aspects of masculinity. And by not um, sealing myself off to that, I've really been able to enjoy life and to recognize how many commonalities I have with other men. And I've been able to to grow great friendships and become so much more of a whole person. For so many years of my life, I felt like my same-sex attraction was a curse and that I must have done something wrong in the pre-existence or that God maybe trusted me too much by giving me something so, so integral into who I am that pulls so far away from the path that I want to walk. But as I've opened myself up to the Spirit and allowed myself to, to really learn and be vulnerable, I've found that my same-sex attraction is one of the greatest blessings of my life. I, I know that that might be hard to wrap one's mind around because in a, in a sense, it's a temptation to not live a, a Christ-centered life. However, I've learned that by, by giving this to the Lord and surrendering this, um, this burden to the Lord, He has made it light and He has made it a gift. That by, by consecrating my life, by trying to love Christ with all my heart, might, mind, and strength, I'm laying my heart on the altar. I, and that's, that's a sacrifice that many people really struggle with, and it certainly hasn't been easy for me. But just as, as Abraham was asked to sacrifice 
his son Isaac, and as Heavenly Father himself sacrificed his son, our Savior Jesus Christ, I have so little to give, and my, my trials pale in comparison to those of Christ, that this is, this is just a small token of what I owe to my Savior. And I found that I don't have, there's a lot less sacrifice involved than I had anticipated. Because of North Star, I've been able to make incredible connections with people from all over the world who experience the same things I have. And I've felt a huge amount of connection and brotherhood through that. And I've been able to see people in different stages of their life and their journey and recognize how Christ has helped them. And that in turn has helped me to recognize that Christ has allowed me to experience these, these attractions as, as a trust, that it's a, it's a beautiful trust that he's placed in me. And that's given me the opportunity to, to grow in, in ways that I otherwise wouldn't have and gain empathy and compassion for others. And I, I trust him. Heavenly Father has given me such a profound sense of hope that I can't find from anywhere else. And though I still have hard days, you know, sometimes I still cry and, and I'm anxious about the future, but because of the promises that Heavenly Father has blessed me with through his prophets and through the teachings of his son, Jesus Christ, I have a profound sense of hope. And I have hope that I'll get married someday, but a, some, a very important decision that I've made is that I'm not going to wait until I'm married to be happy. And there is so much joy to be found in this life. And now I feel comfortable joking about my sexual orientation and the various quirks that I have developed and um, recognizing that a lot of who I am and my personality is attributable to my same-sex attraction. And honestly, I've, I've thought about, a lot about this. If I was able to give up one thing that I was struggling with in this life, it would not be my same-sex attraction. It would be my migraines because I could accomplish so much more and I'd be able to get my psychology degree so much faster. Um, but it, it is what it is. And I'm so grateful that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, through His grace, I've been able to transform my same-sex attraction into a teacher rather than a master. And I am I'm so grateful to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and for the security and vision that it gives me through the restored gospel. And I really hope that others will also be able to give it a chance because of the love and comfort that Christ has given me through his grace. And while, while I don't identify as gay, I certainly recognize um, how that has affected me and my growth and personality. But my ultimate identity is that of a son of God. One of my friends, Ask, ask me, one, if I experienced same-sex attraction, and then as a follow-up question, asked if I was attracted to him. And I'm like, I told you I was gay, not desperate. Like, we, you, can, you can relax and just be fine with someone experiencing same-sex attraction in, in your midst and not have to worry if they're gonna try and flirt with you. And so that's... That's one of the, the funnier questions that I get. Um, another question that I get is, um, because you're sexually abused, you, you kind of assume that that's why you are attracted to men, right? And the answer is a resounding no. I, I really don't feel like that was the cause of my same-sex attraction. And we can, we can burden ourselves with why. Why did this happen? Why me? But when we do that, we're, we're pitting our wisdom against God. And I know that God has the answers, that he has a plan. 
And while I don't know exactly what my place is in the plan of salvation, I know that I certainly have one and that the blessings promised to my ancestors and to me are, are perfectly attainable.